All right, and welcome back to the Started Somewhere show. I'm Ross Alex. I'll be your host. I want to thank you so much for tuning back in. Now, today, my friends, I have an amazing entrepreneur coming out of Long Island, New York. His name is Anthony Mann. Anthony, welcome to the show, bro. Thanks, man. Thanks, man. Pleasure to be here. Uh, looking forward to this. It'll be, uh, this will be a good, good little hour we got going. Yeah, bro. Dude, like, you know, I started back up the podcast, and, like, you're one of the first people – that I wanted to reach out to and get awesome. on the show because to be on, man. just like me, bro, you're a serial entrepreneur, man. <laughs> that, that is very, very true. I haven't, uh, I haven't stopped doing business since I've been 18 years old. It's been, uh, it's been crazy for the past nearly, you know, what is it like 16, seven, it'll be 17 years of business um, this year, which is, which is crazy to think about. I started my first business at 18 and um, it's kind of wild how, how fast it's all gone. Wow, bro. 17 years, man. Nice. Crazy. It I'm sounds going ridiculous on, uh, to say, I got to tell you. Yeah, I'm going on seven. Okay. And for me, seven sounds like a freaking century, dude. <laughs> <laughs> like, wow, seven years ago. Holy yep. crap. Yeah, time flies, man. It's crazy. Us. It's crazy. So, Dude, you're, like I said, man, you're just like me. You're a workhorse, um, you know, innovator, entrepreneur, always doing something, always staying busy. Uh, so the, for the people that don't know you and don't know what you're all about, man, what is your main business? Like, what do you do? So right now, our, our core business, our core competency is social media marketing and advertising. So it's something we kind of fell into. I've, you know, I've owned a lot of companies over the years, and I know we're going to talk about that some more. Um, but at the end of the day marketing, advertising has always been the core of any business, right? You got to be good at sales to own a business. You got to be able to, you know, close deals. But at the end of the day, if you don't have leads coming in and you don't have marketing going on, it's impossible to get those leads organically or paid advertising, right? So this is something that we kind of fell into and realized there was a massive need for it in not only the industry that we're in, but in a lot of other industries that support what we do. Um, so we quickly realized that there was a massive opportunity because we happen to be really fucking good at it. Um, mm. And, you know, when we were not only doing it for ourselves, when we started bringing clients on and we were able to show them, you know, the results that we can get for them, it became something that we were like, wow, we can make a massive amount of money doing this. And a lot of it's automated, right? Like, you know, about 80 to 90% of the business on the advertising side becomes automated. So, you know, once we get our initial setup in there, you know, we're, we're going into ad accounts, you know, every month and this and that, but a lot of it just kind of runs on autopilot, right? We set up our campaigns, we set up our stuff and, and everything just kind of works. So that's kind of what we're doing right now. We've, uh, we started this business back in 2016 um, as an actual business. Obviously, you know, I've been marketing advertising my entire life, um, but as a, as a business, you know, helping other people, whether it be real estate agents or other entrepreneurs or course creators or whatever it might be, we've been doing that for the past four years or so. Nice, man. And, you know, we are making this episode during the whole COVID-19 pandemic. That we are. And, uh, yeah, I've been on calls. You can see my liquor stash right now. It's like, you know, (laughs) the important things in life. (laughs) I I see. I think I see. Is that a a Grey Goose bottle or a Belvedere or something? It's it's some random, like, vodka. I went to, I go to this place called Bottles and Cases, right? It's like a discount. It's like a warehouse distributor, right? So they're out of Tito's, they're out of Grey Goose, and I'm talking to the guy, and he's like, try this thing. I'm like, all right, it's 22 bucks. Great vodka. I'm like, awesome. I'll take hey, it. <laughs> as long as it's not the Georgie, we're good. Oh, no, they had Georgie. Dude, you remember Georgie back in the day? I, we, we used to drink that in college. It, so like, I'll make you laugh. In college, we used to buy handles of Georgie for $4 and change. Oh, and we used, that's uh, like that gross, right? That sounds terrible. It's so bad. Now, now they're like $9, right? To think it's like doubled in price and still awful. Oh, my goodness. Oh, so Dude. bad. <laughs> yeah, we used to do the, uh, the four locos. We used to go hard on the four locos. Yeah, four locos. We used oh, to get man. two kids like four locos. Those things. And yeah, you, you'd be you'd set for the rest of the day. You set for the rest of the week. <laughs> yeah, right? But, uh, you know, so I've been on calls all week. And, um, you know, with different influencers and real estate investors and kind of just gauging where we're at right now with the market and the economy. And, you know, specific to the advertising space, I'm hearing right now that a lot of people are changing up their message. Mm -hmm. And I was actually on a call earlier and uh, the influencer was actually talking about going the TV ad route because prices are cheap right now. Yep. I mean, I haven't taken a look at it to myself, but what advertising in general is is cheap right now. Right. So like, you know, from the social media side, it's it's simple, right? So the way you normally do Facebook advertising, right? You say, okay, listen, I'm going to spend 20 bucks a day and there's only so much inventory. And when we say inventory, right, that's space on your newsfeed, whether it's mobile or desktop space in your right column space on your stories, whatever it might be. 
Right. So what's happened is everybody's home right now, right? So we're uh, we're almost two weeks into this quarantine, mm-hmm. and everybody's home. And what are they doing when they're home, right? They're sitting on their phones, they're sitting on their computers, and they're on Facebook, Instagram all fucking day. So what's happening is there's a massive amount of open inventory. So what we've seen from the same exact ad budgets is we're getting twice the results from it because there's that much more inventory. It's getting in front of more people for less money. And so what's actually happened, funny enough, is most of our clients, and, and we don't run a cheap agency, right? We don't take on $500 or $1,000 a month clients. We're, we're on the higher end of, of what we do. Most of our clients have actually increased their ad spend right now because what they were normally getting three, four, five hundred leads, they're spending a little bit more and they might be getting a thousand leads this month. And at the end of the day, it's about keeping your pipeline full, right? Even though they know most likely they're not closing a deal in the next week, two weeks, maybe a month, right? But when people do start opening their wallets again, they want to have thousands of people in order to sell to. And that's the right mentality to have, especially in this current, uh, current environment. Now, what kind of leads are we talking about? Are so we- it depends, it depends on, the, on the market, right? So you know, we, our, our, we're heavy in the real estate mortgage niche, right? So that's, that's about 90% of our client base. So as you can imagine, right, nobody's allowed to show homes. Like, I'm in New York, right? We're, real estate agents, they were basically like, you guys go fuck yourselves. Like, don't go out of the house. Don't go show homes. Don't cold call. Like, they, they, Cuomo put an executive order in until September 7th, a real estate agent is not allowed to cold call anybody. So that means no calling expired listings, no calling for sell by owners, no calling out of the, like however you were normally doing business, not allowed to do it until September 7th. No so, shit. Yeah, like executive Wait, until order. September 7th? September 7th, you're not allowed to make a cold call. So think of the logic here, right? Wow. So now the only way to make a phone call to somebody is if they opt in to get you to call them, right? So now if I generate you a lead and you're in New York, legally you're allowed to call them because they've opted in for you to of call course. them. So, you know, so it's, it's changing the game, right? It's, it's, and we have a bunch of clients in New York, so it's changing what they're allowed to do. And now the inbound marketing has become massive because – I, I can guarantee you that other states are going to start to do this because, and you know, obviously you heard what's going on with the unemployment and whatnot. They're finally, for the first time ever, allowing real estate agents and gig workers and economy workers and Uber drivers to actually participate in unemployment, which has never happened before um, because you're basically running your own business if you're a gig worker or a real estate agent, right? So the government knows that this is a massive, massive issue and they've basically said, listen, we're going to, we got to help in some way. Um, and, you know, I just, it's going to be really interesting to see how this plays out over the next couple of months. Obviously, you know, not allowing a real estate agent to make a cold call until September 7th basically screws the whole year, right? This is the selling yeah. season we're in now, March to like, you know, July. Mm-hmm. And them not being able to function as real estate agents is an absolute mess. Wow. You know, I would expect with more attention on social that uh, adds- Sorry, Matt, ad- I, you're breaking up and I know it's my computer. I know my internet sucks. Say it again. I said I would expect that with more attention on social right now, that PPC would actually go up and not That's down. Flying down, like flying down. Why? It's, it's, why? Why is? Why is it going in reverse? It's inventory. It's just an inventory thing, right? So there's that much more inventory available, and Facebook is doing everything they can to fill the inventory, right? Because they want to make their mm. money. So because there's so much more inventory, it's costing us less to get, or our CPM is, is the level we use, right? CPM is the cost, the cost per thousand people to right. get in front of, right? So what would have normally been 10 to $15 for real estate is now five, $6. So same amount of money getting in front of thousands of more people. So, and in turn, the more people you get in front of, the more leads you generate, right? So right now wow. we have a campaign running that we're generating like 40 cent leads on. Um, and it's, it's ridiculous. I mean, you know, this guy's got a thousand dollar budget. He's going to wind up with like 2000 leads this month alone. Wow. So for all the investors out there and agents, cause you know, we have a lot of real estate people tuning in. Uh, would you recommend that they go out there and start running ad campaigns if, if they weren't doing so already? And if they were doing it, would you recommend them to scale it or just continue at the rate that they were going at? So two parts of that, right? Yeah. If you're not already advertising 100% start advertising, buy a course, buy something to figure out. And, and here's the thing. Don't reinvent the wheel, right? If you know somebody or you know of a group that somebody's in and they're running specific ads that you want to run, go pay them for an hour of their time, get the ad that you know is running and run that ad, right? Don't reinvent it. It's going to take you, if you're trying to do this all by yourself and you're like, oh no, I know what my clients want this and that, it's not going to work. I promise you that. So go pay somebody 500 bucks, a thousand bucks, go literally license their ad from them, run that ad. If you guys want, I, you know, I, you can contact me, I'll send you guys ads that we use in our business. Okay. But the other part of that is yes, if you are already running successful ads, scale them. Start spending mm. more money. Don't just, don't just change the budget from $50 a day to $100 a day. Duplicate your ad, send it to $100 or $200 a day, whatever it is, 
and scale those ads right now is an unbelievable time for advertising. You know, we, we've this this time with the with the the cost of advertising right now, it reminds me back of like 2011, 2012, when we were getting 10, 15, 20 cent leads. It's very, very similar to that, especially in the real estate world right now. Boom. Yeah. Uh, and we were talking offline. Uh, my actually, my VA agency that works with investors and agents, we do a lot of cold calling, cold texting. Like the numbers are going through the roof right now. Yeah. You know, Everyone's home, right? I Nobody's, mean, yeah, we're getting yeah, answers excuse. like no tomorrow. I mean, it's <laughs> nobody's, unreal. Nobody's like, oh, I can't talk right now. I'm at work. Everybody's but, home. Yeah. But the, but the prospects are actually hot. Like people mm -hmm. are like, yeah, I'm interested in selling my house. Like, I, right. you know, I don't, well, it's, there's it's a lot of, scared, uh, right? people yeah, there's a lot of fear out coming. there. Exactly. A lot of fear out there you in know, the market. People, people so. are actually scared right now. So, so you're doing a lot of advertising. You're doing a lot of, uh, you know, social media management and, and whatnot. But I know that that's not your only business. Uh, you've done a Correct. bunch of other stuff. You've done some tech stuff. We actually met at a crypto meetup in New York City. Uh, so Correct. I know you do some trading. You, you, you kind of like the jack of all trades, man. You, you're the guy I call. I'll be like, hey, man, you know about this? Like, yeah, I know about this. <laughs> I remember one time, bro. One time I called you. It was like 2 o'clock in the morning or something. I started talking about something. I started, I brought up a company. You're like, yeah, I know the CEO. His name is like da-da-da-da-da, da-da-da-da, VP, da-da-da-da. I just had lunch with him last week. <laughs> so you're like the That's jack. That's about right. <laughs> yeah, you, you know, you, you're like the know-it-all. So what are some other businesses that you've been involved in, uh, some other areas of expertise? Uh, so, I mean, we could just, you know, start right from the beginning here. So, yeah, I'll tell you one of my favorite stories about, you know, getting into business, right, right time, right place, right? So I'm 18 years old, just got into college. I went to Binghamton University. To be totally honest, if there was the same school today, there's no fucking chance I would get into that university. <laughs> uh, so I'm there, you know, a lot of smart people around. And um, my grandfather, he goes, he owned the company at the time, so the electronic testing equipment, and he flew overseas three or four times a year. And every time he went overseas, he had to get unlocked cell phones. And basically, he'd have to basically use, you know, whatever, whatever carrier is there, right? So he'd have to go, he'd have to rent a cell phone there, he'd have to buy a SIM card. And then when he left, whatever it was, he was in Japan, when he left, he'd then have to give the phone back. And then he went to China, and then he had to go and he had to get the phone. And he had to get a SIM card for it. And then when he went to Korea, he had to get the phone back. And he had to get another phone. So it's like a whole process, right? And it's like, it's this annoying thing. He's got to do it in every single one of those countries that he goes to. And so we're having this conversation. And I'm like, you could definitely just buy an unlocked phone. And he's like, no way. So we start doing some research. And, and the kid that, um, kid that I went to college with, he, he had, weirdly enough, already kind of had this idea to start this unlocked cell phone business. So I was like, all right, well, let's do it, right? So we decide that we're going to go buy 10 or 20 of these unlocked phones. We're going to throw them on eBay, right? We'll just see if people will buy them. So I tell my grandfather about it. I give him like the Motorola Razor and it's unlocked, right? So he takes it with him overseas and it works fucking perfectly. He's all excited. He's like, this is amazing. Huge need for it, blah, 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 blah. So we put them on eBay and I'm like, you know, the phones are cheap. They're like, they're like 90, a hundred bucks, right? They're not anything crazy. So we put them up for 99 cents. We're like, I'll do what the market will, will yield for these. So 99 cent auction turned into a $125 sale. I'm like, great. We made 25 bucks. Awesome. Within six months, we were one of the first 10 titanium power sellers on eBay. We're doing 150,000 a month in gross sales. Um, we literally one of the first 10, we had like the stupid badge and the whole deal. Like we had articles written on eBay about, you know, what we were doing. And, you know, we did that for years, right? We did it all through college and, and in 2004, I realized that the business was changing, right? So we, I, you know, we're watching what the FBA was. Doing. I realized that the cell phone companies go on home cell phones. And so hey, I realized quick, Anthony, out you, of the business. I'm yeah. sorry to interrupt you. Can you just back up just a few sentences because we, we cut out. Where, where did I cut off? Um, after you said that you realized something was changing. Okay. So yeah, I was keeping up with like the FCC, you know, what they were doing. And, and so I realized that the phone companies were going to soon be forced to unlock their phones, which meant my business was going to fail very, very swiftly and very quickly. So I literally approached my partner at the time and I was like, listen, I want out. That's it. And so he bought the shares for me of, of his part of the company. And within six months, exactly what I thought was going to happen, the FCC mandated all cell phone carriers. So like now, like my iPhone is unlocked, right? If I go grab a, if I go to Europe, I could put a SIM card in here. Right. And it just works, right? So I realized it was going to happen. It did happen. 
and the business you know was gone in eight months after after I got out of it. So um, you know sometimes having the foresight to get out even when things are going amazing is you know something that we were making great money. You know we were you know like I said doing one hundred fifty thousand a month in gross sales. It wasn't all profit, but we, we had a nice healthy margin on there about fifteen percent. So there was good good money coming in, and to walk away from that um, took a lot, but it was the absolute right move at the time. So you're doing $150,000 in sales mm -hmm. on eBay. Yep. And just uh, on eBay. That was it. That yeah. was our whole business, selling them on eBay. And we didn't even, we, we got to a point where we weren't even buying the phones anymore, right? Like we had our supplier and we'd sell, you know, two, 300 phones a week. We'd literally show up to the supplier, write him a check, take the phones, go, go pack them, send them to, bring them to the post office and send them out and do it all over again week after week. So, okay. So, so how much net profit would you say that you were making so the company was probably was running about yeah probably about 13 to 15 percent in net profit uh at the end of the day so uh, you know i would say probably safely we were probably taking home roughly twenty five thousand in profit per month and then 50 um, 50 right it was a 50 50 deal and we had we had a shipping manager as well so they were gonna okay. pay like 500 bucks a week so again like you know so you're making like 10 g's a month give or take yeah 20, okay 20, so 18 19 years old easily yeah 10 grand a month so, so let me ask you this 18 19 years old you're making 10 grand a month right what kept you in school like so, i would have dropped out i did drop yeah. out but i mean if i'm making that kind of money at that age i'm so probably I, gonna think i'm a millionaire right? yeah <laughs> so for me for me and, and a lot of business has been like this for me it was never really about the money right it's about the it's about the deal for me it always has been the money always comes with the deal. And I mean, I, you know, I'll talk about it in a little bit, my the first real estate deal I ever did. Um, and I made a fortune on it, but honestly getting that deal done, I didn't care if that would have been about I mean, 10 grand in profit or nearly the 200 that I did. Um, but it was all about the deal for me. So watching myself and, and this one kid build a business literally from an idea into what we made it into and, and realistically what it could have been if the FCC didn't make the changes that they did. I mean, this business had the potential. I mean, and again, we weren't marketing. We weren't, we didn't have a website. Like we were selling phones on eBay. Like it was stupid. Like if we were really running a business, we could have probably been doing 50, a hundred grand a month in profit, but we weren't right. Cause we were 18, 19 year old kids in college selling phones on eBay. It was like, it was ridiculous. Right. So, you know, what kept me in school was the experience of school. Right. I, I don't, I don't think that school, especially for me, was all about the education. Um, I was an economics major. I'm not going to go try and tell people how the world economy is going to run. Like, there was really no – economics really didn't mean anything, right? It's okay, I understand how the world works. Awesome. But what job am I going to get with an economics degree, right? Um, so for me, it was more about the experience. You know, I was in a fraternity. I had a bunch of friends, the whole deal. So it was, uh, it was mm -hmm. different. College was much more about the experience than the education for me at the time. Mm, okay. I, I dig it, man. So you ended up graduating, uh, I assume. I did not. I left three months before my uh, <laughs> three months before okay. the end of school. Long story. I don't want to get into that. But wait, 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 wait. Three months before getting your degree. So I, had, I had some family stuff go on. So it was literally I was going to go back and I wound up getting into real estate, funny enough. And uh, I sold Dude. my first deal in 11 days and I never looked back. <laughs> I mean, you should finish the three months and just get your degree. For you that. know what? I'm, my problem right now is that I have to go back. They're all like upper level classes. So I'd literally have to go to Binghamton. And don't get me wrong. I haven't checked on this in probably 10 years. But at the time, if I wanted to finish, I would have to go back up there for a semester and literally live in Binghamton. And yeah, you, you'd be like Van Wilder. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, dude. Uh, interesting stuff, man. So, okay, you, you start this business. Now, I, I like to ask my guests this question. Do you believe entrepreneurship is taught or do you believe that you're born an entrepreneur? So I think it's a combination of the two, right? You need to have a certain drive. And I was actually talking to someone yesterday about this, right? So, and, and she's a teacher and she, Louie, come on, bro. Louie. Sorry, my dog's going nuts. <laughs> um, so she's a teacher and she, for the first time ever, she's working from home, right? So the teachers, you know, you go into the so school and you teach and you come home. And now they're making her do like virtual learning or whatever it's called, or whatever they call it, virtual classrooms, right? Right. And so... One of the issues that she's finding is she's like, I'm not motivated. Like, how do you stay motivated every day? I'm like, I don't know. It's just like what I do. It's what I've always done, right? I've always worked from home. I've always just woken up in the morning and been like, all right, this is what I got to get done today. And I go and I get that done today. And, you know, I've never had like a, a boss or anything like that where 
Um, you know, I have someone telling me every single day, like what to do this and that. And I, I have had one job in my entire, my, my career since then. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a couple, but um, like literally, you know, it can be taught in a lot of ways, right? You could tell people what to do and how to do it and how you need to act and how to close. You could teach people a lot about it, but deep down, if you don't have the drive to do it, it doesn't matter what you're taught, right? Like it, mm. it takes a unique person to be an entrepreneur willing to take all the risks that we take on a daily basis and still be able to wake up tomorrow morning. Exactly. I think a lot of, uh, a lot of it comes down to your fear tolerance. Um, say, say it again, you broke up first. Oh, say it I think, again. Uh, so a lot of it, in my opinion, comes down to your fear tolerance. Yep. Like entrepreneurs are known to be very bold, big risk takers. Like if I could lose it all tomorrow, I'll just start all over again kind of right. mentality. It's like sink or swim. You know, guys yep. like us, people out there that are also entrepreneurs, we wake up and the first thing we think about is how can we crush today? How can yep. we make money? How can we impact the world? How can we help people? So on and so forth. Whereas, you know, that's, that's a, it's a risky play, you know, yep. like, I mean, even through this whole quarantine situation, like it's crazy. I, I joke about it, but I mean, dude, my life really has not changed. Like I work from home anyway. Well, uh, I mean, weirdly enough, I've, I've yeah. picked up, you know, more clients in the past week than I normally do in a week. Right. Um, just, Literally another day yeah. at the office. Yeah, another another day at the office. I mean, minus being deathly afraid to go to a Starbucks, <laughs> <Right. laughs> get handed a cup that has the virus on it. Right. You know, right. but right. Uh, I haven't. I've been good, man. I haven't gone. I haven't like eat, had takeout. I haven't. I haven't done anything. I've yeah. been cooking every meal. Well, apparently, the it's virus it. stays on cor cardboard for like thirty six hours or Great. whatever. Great. So I, I ordered takeout the other night. They <laughs> they brought in a pizza box. <laughs> I threw the thing out right away. Oh, my oh God. man. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you. I do. I agree that, you know, entrepreneurship, certain aspects of it can be taught. Mm -hmm. But I also believe that something in people like us just tells us, like, yeah. we're hardwired like, to, like, right. This is what we got to do. Like, yeah, and I come from, I don't know what your family is, is from, but I come from my, everybody in my family has been a business owner, right? That's all I've ever known is owning a business, right? Nobody's ever worked for anybody else. Right? It's like, we've all owned businesses. So that's like, that's been ingrained in me mm. since I could remember. Right. Right. I like it, man. So you start this cell phone business and you end up dropping out of college. Yep. Fast forward a little bit. You ended up getting into real estate. Correct. So my dad's been in the real estate business for, he's going on 42 years now. Um, he's been in forever, right? His whole life. It's all he's ever done. Um, he's that residential guy. He loves, you know, selling people's houses, working with buyers, the whole deal. Um, so it's, it's been in my blood, right? So when I got a school, uh, I immediately took my real estate, you know, licensing test at the time. It was only 40 hours. Now it's like 75 or 90. I don't know what the hell it is now. Um, <clears throat> and so literally I went to work. He owned a Remax office at the time. This is, this is 2007, 2007. Um, so he was a Remax office at the time. And I go to work, right? I start making phone calls. It's in that. We get a call that comes into the office. Somebody wants to see a house. I bring them to see three houses. Two days later, I get a call. All right, I want to buy one of those houses. So within an 11-day period, I had sold a $550,000 house. The commission was on it was going to be 11 grand. Um, 30 days later, that house, or 35 days later, that house closes. And so my first two months out of school, literally, I made 11,000 bucks. And I was hooked. I was like, oh, man. I'm like, there's real money to be made in this business, right? And then I got a real fucking hard dose of reality. 2008 rolled around and the world fell apart mm. and there were vacancies everywhere. And, you know, people weren't buying houses and people weren't selling houses and it was crazy. So this is, this is the first time I've ever worked for somebody in my life. I started literally getting on the phone because I realized there was going to be a massive flood of foreclosures, right? I was watching what the banks were happening. The banks are collapsing this and that. And I'm like, this is, this is a mess. I'm like, there's no other part of this business that I could be in except the foreclosure business, but I don't know how to get there. So I literally start picking up the phone and calling banks, right? Who do I talk to? I want to get your foreclosures. Who do I talk to? Who do I talk to? And so this goes on for months, like months and months and months. And so about six months later, um, I used to call this guy every day at, at one o'clock and um, or 12 o'clock and literally it was every single day. And, and it got to the point where he would just answer the phone and be like, hey, what's up, Anthony? I don't have anything for you today. And just hang up on me. So it was like comedy. And so one day I call him. Every, like I could do every day and he picks up the phone he's like all right Anthony listen he's like you're a real fucking pain in the ass he's like I've got pissed at one of my other brokers I'll give you one shot you got one property you got 30 days to sell it I'm like all right what do I gotta do right so now mm. I got the opportunity and that's it so I sold that property in three days 
And that opened up the floodgates for me, right? He started giving me more properties. I was now able to approach other banks and say, hey, listen, I sell foreclosures for this bank. <clears throat> and that started to open up some markets for me. So started getting some accounts and selling some properties. And I was approached by a guy who owned another brokerage. And again, I'm working with my dad at the time. And so I get approached by a guy who, who runs another brokerage. And he's like, listen, he's like, you know, and, and he's a big, big REO guy, right? That's all he does. He sells 200 properties a year. And he's like, listen, I want you to come work for me. I'm like, that's nice. And he's like, no, no, no. He's like, I want you to come work for me. He's like, salary, you know, commission override. He's like, I want you to run the business. He's like, I don't, I don't want to do it anymore. Okay. Sounds good to me. So I go, I meet with him, gives me a nice salary, get a commission override at everybody. And the guy I've come to find out, he owns, you know, a ton of property. And so he's, he's making like 150, 200 grand a month in just passive income from rentals. So he literally does not want to do anything with the real estate business anymore. So I come in and, you know, I've come in literally as a 23 year old kid. Now I got 40 employees who are all older than me. And now they have to all answer to me. So it was very interesting to, to go into a situation like that. And I worked there for about 16 or 15 months. Um, and my real goal there was to develop relationships with people that I didn't already have them with. So clients like One West Bank, which was Indie Mac, clients I just could not get to, simply couldn't get to. I developed met great relationships with. And when I left the company, it was, a, it was a very simple thing. We had a one year deal. And I basically, you know, at the end of that year said to him, listen, I don't just, you know, want the salary and override anymore. I want a part of the company. And I think I deserve that. We, he was doing 2 million in, in uh, commissions when I started. We did 7 million the year after. So I figured it was a pretty fair thing to ask for a partnership in a company. And for lack of a better put it, he told me to go fuck myself. Uh, so I said, okay, well, here's my two weeks notice and I'm out. Um, so literally two weeks later, I left. And unbeknownst to him, a lot of his personal accounts had been shut down and have been, have been transferred to my name because one of the guys they had working on his accounts was doing some shady shit. So in order to keep the accounts, they basically put them in my name. So when I left, I basically said to him, hey, listen, you know, I'll, I have no problem giving you an override on these accounts. Like, you know, they're, they're, they were your accounts, but I'm going to handle these, so I'll give you 20%, right? And he was like, no, 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 we'll just keep those accounts. I was like, okay, if you don't make a deal now, then fine. So about a month later, he realizes that I'm getting all the listings from his old accounts. And so he sends me a letter saying, hey, listen, I deserve 50% of those. And I literally sent back my resignation letter in which he signed saying he gets 0% of any accounts because he, he wanted to handle them himself. Um, so that turned into a whole thing, uh, wound up into a lawsuit, the whole deal. Uh, but in the end, wound up winning. And that was, that was pretty much that. So that was the only experience I ever had working for somebody in my entire life. And that quickly then spiraled into, you know, about a year later spiraled into me then getting into the foreclosure business myself and building my own team. And uh, we still, you know, have that business to this day and it still sells a bunch of properties a year. Wow. Nice, man. So uh, I want to back up here because okay. you said that when 08 came around, there were some tough times yeah. right? and you had to adjust yep. the business model to oh, getting yeah. into the foreclosure space. Yep. So, that's actually super relevant for what's going on right now because we are in, you know, kind of like a downturn, right? Yep. And there's a lot of uncertainty. A lot of people don't know exactly what's going to happen. And there's people that have been like rocking out, right? For the last three years, four years, five years, everything's been great. And now just like that, everything's getting shooken up. Yep. And there's a lot of people that are just freaking out. Right. And uh, I know in fact, somebody listening to this, you know, whether in the real estate space, the service industry space, they're like, what the hell do I do? Right. right. How do I adjust, you know, for the restaurant owner out there? I have a buddy that owns a restaurant uh, actually in Jersey. And I talked to do him me a favor after this call, uh, reach, reach out to him. Um, so right now the agency is doing taking on restaurants for absolutely hundred percent free. They just got to pay for their ad spend. We'll do all their advertising for them. Um, so really? anybody listening to this, if we're still in the COVID-19 era, when you listen to this, if you know somebody, you are a restaurant, or whatever it is, our agency only charges 2000 bucks to restaurants a month. Uh, it's absolutely free. We'll set up your campaigns. We'll do everything that you guys need as if you were one of our clients. Uh, we really feel, especially for the restaurant owners out there, we know it's tough right now. So um, if you're listening to this and you are or know a restaurant owner, have them reach out to Ross or myself and, and we'll get you guys set up within a day or two. That's incredible, man. Thank you for doing that for the, of course. For the audience. But yeah, so I spoke to him and I, you know, he said, man, I don't know what to do. You know, My rent yeah. is X amount of dollars per month. I'm only allowed to do takeout. Takeout mm -hmm. is slow because he's in like the cafe business. I talked about right. this on another episode and you know, people don't really do takeout from cafes. No. You know, up, <laughs> I mean, up here in the Northeast, New York, New Jersey, like diners are not getting love at all. No. No. Uh, it's a sit down, 
It's a sit down experience. Right. So like, what would you tell somebody right now that needs to adjust? They're freaking out. They're having anxiety. You know, they're stressed. What, yeah. What so I think person? it's, I think it's tough, right? I think that this is one of those times where it kind of gives everybody a kick in the ass, right? Like where, you know, the, the bartender that's been in their job for 12 years, but wanted to get out five years ago, right? The, the restaurant server that's been in their job for 25 years and wish 10 years ago, they would have started a business, right? I think that we have an opportunity right now. Like, listen, the government is coming in. They're giving us 2 trillion bucks. They're not giving it to guys like me. You're like you, Ross, but they're, they're out there helping people, right? So right now you have a small opportunity to take the next couple of weeks and figure out what you want to do for the rest of your life. Okay, and if that means you want to be a bartender for the next 30 years, then awesome. Like, wait till the restaurant opens back up. Go do your thing. If that makes you happy and fulfilled at the end of the day, go do it. If you realize right now, you're like, I can't believe I've been doing that for the past 20 years, then now's the time to figure out what to do, right? And, you know, right now, online businesses are the only things that are thriving, right? So we, we have a bunch of gym clients as well. Um, so obviously, you know, every gym in New York State got shut down, right? And gyms pretty much around the country are shut down. And so what we did is we had all of our gym trainers go out and make personal videos, right? So basically they're going to be doing training programs and you sign up for it instead of paying $50, you know, a month for your membership, maybe you pay 15 or 20 bucks, but now the gym is creating new revenue and it's all online. Okay. And now mm -hmm. that there's no overhead involved in that revenue, right? So, you know, there, there are opportunities for every single business out there. If you just kind of look outside of the box a little bit and say, how can I do whatever business I'm in? And again, it doesn't work for every single business, right? There's no way I can virtualize a bartender. There's no way I can virtualize a, a server, right? A, a barista. There, there's jobs you simply can't do mm -hmm. virtually, but there are plenty of opportunities surrounding every job that you can figure something out, right? If you're a bartender, why don't you have a YouTube channel right now? Why aren't you online talking about your favorite drink and how you come up with them and these new things that you're trying, right? Like same thing with like restaurant servers. Like why aren't you talking about the things that you love in regards to your business, right? Even if you're just reviewing every single restaurant you've ever went to and the experiences mm -hmm. you had, right? There is, an ex there is a way to monetize everything in today's world. And because you're sitting home and you have no other responsibility right now except to sit home and stay in your house, go monetize or go do something that is out of your comfort zone that can make you a couple dollars in the long run. It's not short-term money right now, right? All this stuff is long-term money. Dude, so you're literally saying the exact thing, almost verbatim, uh, on what Gary V was saying the other day on his. Uh, I don't know if you follow Gary V at all, but I he, do. Yeah, I haven't, yeah. I haven't listened to him in a couple yeah. weeks. Ago. So he's been doing these like tea, tea with Gary things yeah. in the morning, these live streams. And somebody asked that very, uh, very same question, which was, you know, I own a restaurant. What should I do? Yada yada yada. And Gary said, you know, tell your story. Right. You know, go go in your kitchen and video yourself making every single dish and explain the thought process behind it, yada, you know, so on and so forth, yada, yada, yada. So, um, which, which actually reminds me that on TikTok right now, which is, you know, massive, yeah, blown up. everybody should be on TikTok. I'm on TikTok. <laughs> uh, TikTok is blowing up. You know, you got people. I haven't made a video yet, but I watch a lot of shit on there. Anthony, you have, there's people on TikTok. Okay. 40 million followers that it's started crazy. their accounts in like July, like literally wow. like last year. And they're famous. Uh, the, the girl, Charlie, the, she's like one of the most famous TikTok. She was just on one of the late night shows. Uh, you know, it's unbelievable. Crazy. You know, unbelievable. But anyway, so there's this TikToker that actually, she's a bartender. And she literally videos herself making cocktails. Yeah. Millions of, millions, millions of followers. Millions of Crazy. views. And hey, eventually yeah. you can monetize that, right? Even if you know yeah. how to monetize it right now, like yeah. generate the following and monetize it one day. You don't have to do it right this second. That's it. Well, I mean, dude, if you get millions of followers on TikTok, you're getting brand deals. Like yeah. there's no question about that. So yeah, I mean, it's just, you know, it's a matter of adjusting, right? Like, yep. you know. What it, it comes is, down to. Even for me, I mean, luckily, so I do most of my business down in Houston in the real estate space and Houston is being affected by coronavirus, but it's not as bad as it is up here. So we're still doing yep. like showings and we're still doing listings and whatnot. I mean, you know, it doesn't seem to be as bad down there. So I'm very, very thankful for that. But uh, as far as being in the house, you know, myself, I'm just adjusting, doing more live streams, doing more podcasts, right. doing more reading. I'm writing a book that I've been putting off for years. Perfect time so, to do it. Perfect time to do it, right? Same. Do it. You know, do the things that you've been putting off for a long time. Right. You're forced to stay home right now. So yeah. the shit that you're like, oh, I wish I had the time to do it. You have the time now. <laughs> yeah. 
No, exactly. And, uh, you know, I think that when we all make it out of this, uh, there's definitely going to be a lot of prosperity. A lot of mm -hmm. people are going to uh, completely, you know, change their situations. Yeah, I agree. Um, so, Anthony, I'm curious, man, being that you're, you know, a stay at home entrepreneur, you know, work from home kind of deal. What is the average day like for you? And I ask this question because so many people that get started as entrepreneurs, you know, they go out tomorrow and they're like, okay, I'm going to be an entrepreneur. I just quit my job or, you know, whatever. I want to go out and start a business. And they wake up in the morning and now they're like, oh shit, like, what am I supposed to do? Yep. And oh. they, they lose their schedule uh you know that's that that schedule mindset that they're used to so what is the average day like for you so i'm, I'm not an early riser by any means so that probably surprised a lot of people uh, my girl is looking at me like yeah you're not um so literally i'm not out of bed on a typical day until 9 30 maybe 10 o'clock at times um i don't really get started working until between 10 and 10 30 on the average day um, but with that said i work very regularly until one two three o'clock in the morning um, so I am a night guy, right? I, I like not being bothered at night and working much more than I like being awake early and dealing with fires that are put out, right? So one thing that I've noticed being in business for a long time, I used to wake up early, right? I used to wake up, you know, like everybody else, 730 in the morning at the office by nine, doing the whole traditional workday thing, right? Mm -hmm. What I've noticed is that, you know, fires or like problems in anybody's business tend to happen first thing in the morning. Right. So what I did was I just eliminated that part of my day. And I said, you know what, if I don't have to deal with that first thing in the morning, the rest of my day is going to go a lot smoother. So I typically don't open emails until 10 o'clock. Um, I really, you know, unless it's a, it's a personal friend or my parents or whatnot, um, I won't respond to any text messages before 10 o'clock. Um, but again, if somebody has an issue at one o'clock in the morning, like, you know, this, we've had conversations at two o'clock in the morning. Um, mm -hmm. I'm up, I'm up late. So my day is very different than the, than the average person. Um, and literally it starts with emails. It goes into the client calls. We got to, you know, deal with what's going on uh, with our advertising, who, who needs uh, to basically, you know, get their ads redone today, what funnels are working, what funnels aren't working, what new campaigns we have to build, what kind of marketing we're doing for our own business. You know, there's a hundred things that are on the list every day. It's just a matter of, you know, getting them all done. Um, we try to obviously <laughs> limit the amount of fires we have to put on a daily basis. Obviously, there's things you have to deal with as a business owner every single day. That's not going to change. Um, but we try to manage it the best that we can. And part of that is not being available first thing in the morning when everybody else is available. So how do you manage working from home and being in work mode versus just sitting on that couch behind you and <laughs> throwing Netflix on? Yeah. So it, it really just, it's, it's kind of like a, just the way you are, right? For me, I wake up and I'm thinking about, all right, what do we got to do today? What kind of income we have coming in for this month? You know, like I'm always thinking about the next thing, right? So all right, what are our expenses this month? Do we need to cut anything? Do we need to do more advertising? You know, how have our customer acquisition costs trended over the past three months? You know, like, so I'm always thinking about the next thing to go, right? So I'm, I work a lot less in the business than I do on the business. And I try and worry about, all right, how are we going to grow to where I want to be by the end of the year? by the end of two years, the end of five years, 10 years, right? Like, you know, are we going to get an offer to, for someone to buy our company in two years, whatever it might be. Uh, and you know this, you know, like we, we get asked pretty frequently to purchase other people's companies. Um, so it just depends, you know, it depends on the day. But for me, I'm just naturally motivated in that sense. I don't really need, you know, anybody or anything to, to tell me, oh, like, you know, I don't need this miracle morning crap. Like, oh, good, get up at 5 a.m. and meditate and, you know, go to the sauna and take a walk. Like, I don't even that shit. I get out of bed, I take a shower, I go to work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I can relate to you. I'm not a 5 a.m. person. Yeah. Um, I'm definitely not. I'm more like, I, I flip-flop. Sometimes I'm up until like 5 a.m. Right. You know, I just had a baby two months ago. Yeah. <laughs> so I've been, up until like last week, I was going to sleep. At, I kid you not, literally like 9 a.m. It was, you Jesus. cannot, yeah, they wake up every two hours to eat. Right. You cannot get a full <laughs> night's sleep. It's, 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 forget about it. But, uh, you know, then I switch. I go from being a night owl to waking up at like 7.30, 8 a.m. Right. And working. I will say that for me, I feel a lot more productive when I, when I get started earlier than when I do later. I don't know why that is. I don't Interesting. know. I, I just feel like, you know, my mentor used to always say something. He used to, always used to say this to me. He said, Ross, you got to be up during business hours. Like there's no... Right. There's no, uh, you know, ands, ifs, or buts about it. You know, in the real estate world, the contractors are working during business hours. The title companies are working during. Right. Got to be up during business hours. So, 
that's kind of been like instilled. I don't know. Maybe I just feel better about myself. <laughs> I get started early, but uh, I enjoy being up at night. I do. I, I enjoy late night, quiet time. You know, you can grind out. Nobody bothering you. Yeah. So, hey, for the listeners out there, let us know in the comments. Uh, are you a nighttime person or are you a, uh, you know, 5 a.m. club type of person? So, I want to talk, I want to switch gears here and talk a little bit about the challenges. Okay. Yep. Because, and, and I don't know if this is applicable to you, but you're human, of course, so I'm sure it does. But, you know, being an entrepreneur has its ups and its downs. It's like a roller coaster. Yep. Right? And I mean, I've had moments in my personal business where I've literally wanted to just break down, cry, crawl like, under a rock, yeah. eyes out. Yeah. Like, and I don't, I mean, I don't cry. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, I wish I did because it probably would feel good, but I don't know. I may, I think I'm like a robot or something, but <laughs> I've had those moments, right? You know, um, I actually, I just got out of a huge lawsuit not long ago. I've had deals go bad. I mean, you know, let's talk about your challenges over the last 17 years. Like, what would you say is like the number one biggest challenge that you've ever had to overcome? The biggest challenge I had to overcome. So, I mean, you know, it's an interesting way to, to say it like this, but I mean, you're from New York, you kind of understand what it's like to be here, right? So, you know, New York is the financial capital world. Um, for, for lack of a better way to put it, it seems like everybody's making a million dollars a year, everybody's spending constantly. And so, you know, one of the things that really took me a while to realize was like, to, to, that you didn't have to keep up with everybody, right? So when I started in business in general, you're making good money and as quickly as I was making it, I was spending it, right? I had to maintain a lifestyle, I had a certain car and I had to look in Infinity G35. Like I had certain things that ultimately didn't matter. Um, and it took me a lot of years to realize that you don't have to keep up with everybody. You can be happy just being yourself and being who you want to be. Um, and you know, I would probably say it took me probably like five, seven years of literally as much money as I was making, I was spending it just as quickly. I made, if I made 150 grand a year, I was spending 200 grand a year. If I spent, made 200 grand a year, I was spending 250 grand a year. Um, so literally as quickly as it was coming in, it was going out. And there came a point where I was like, this is just stupid, right? And, and on top of that, New York State is one of the heaviest tax in the country, right? I pay about 40% of my money in taxes. So I watch basically, you know, for every time I close a deal, um, literally, I'm like, hey, here you go, Uncle Sam. It was great being your partner. Uh, so it's like, it's like crazy at a time, right? So, you know, for me, it took me a while to, to realize that it's not about what other people think about you. It's what you think about yourself. Um, and once I really realized that and I made myself happy with the things around me and, you know, like, you know, like I'm on the boat all summer and this kind of stuff. And like, I don't really, you know, I don't care about anybody else, what, what they think about it and the car I drive, like I drive, you know, a Jeep Cherokee from 2014. Like, I don't care anymore, right? Like I know that I'm doing good business and my clients are happy and I'm happy and, and that's all that matters to me. Um, so it took a very long time to figure that out and, and to get out of my own way in realizing that it was about me and nobody else. Mm. Yeah, it's definitely tricky nowadays with social and very. everything, you know, everybody's you superficial. Know, yeah, everybody's like, oh, look at me. I'm on vacation here and I'm on vacation there. And I got the new car and I got the like, it's crazy yeah. when you watch it happen. One thing I will say for the listeners out there, you know, if you're, especially if you're just getting started and, and this definitely ties into what you just said is when you compare yourself to other people, you, you have to realize that there's a very high chance that you're comparing yourself to a faker, like Correct. a pretender, like they're not really doing what they say they're doing. And, and I mean, I go on Instagram, I'm going through my stories and I get 20 ads from all these multi-millionaire e-commerce drop shipping <laughs> <Right>. wizards, <laughs> you know, everyone's a everyone's an e-commerce millionaire nowadays. Right. And I mean, you have to understand that my friends, a lot of that stuff is not real. Like it's, it's very, the, easy. the good majority of it is real. Yeah. It's, it's very easy to pretend. So when you compare yourself and you constantly get discouraged, like, well, I don't have a Lambo. I've been in business for three years. Right. You know, I, I don't have a private jet. I'm not flying to, you know, the, the Turks and Caicos. Oh, dude, you heard that. Did you hear what happened with Grant Cardone? I did. Wait, like wait, wait, wait. What, 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 what deal with Grant Cardone? Did you hear what happens? Like what wait, he did? About his employees? Yeah. 
Yeah, I did. Like, well, I actually, I saw, so I saw Meet Kevin's video. Okay. I don't know if you watch. Him I did. Yeah, that's. I, I saw that as well. Yeah. I reached out to Meet Kevin, by the way, to, to be on the show. We'll see. We'll see what happens. <laughs> Let's see if he goes. He, him and Grant have beef, though, man. They, they, they okay. go there all the time so. i've seen i've seen a couple different videos though and i've seen some stuff from that he's actually put out and some of his employees have put out yeah. very interesting to kind of watch watch that happen yeah so he, he he laid off for for the listeners out there grant cardone apparently had to lay off like 41 people or something right i think it was more than i think it was 40 percent of his workforce so wound up being about 80 people yeah yeah i saw that what Sad. are your thoughts on that i mean listen you know if you're the way i feel about it if i got a private jet nine houses and 12 cars i'm not laying anybody off like it's not gonna happen like i'll do i'll sell a car to pay their salary for the next year if i have to like it's not gonna it, happen. it is a little i mean look i love grant Met i do too i times. i like i like him like him. yep but it is a little uh you know eye opening kind of eyebrow raising yep like you live in like a 25 million dollar condo he you owns a, a jet yeah he, he owns own a, a he owns a jet I mean, I mean, you know, and, and, and jet. keep them employed for the 40 years. Yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> you know, you don't even have to necessarily sell the jet, but I mean, it is about like a little over maybe $1 billion properties under management. Mm -hmm. This guy's collecting money from left yeah. and right. You know, uh, I'm just very, very surprised. I was, that. I was taken back when I saw yeah. that. I was like, yeah, you know what, definitely. you want to cut their hours a couple hours, they're working from home, cut them 10 hours each. Like mm -hmm. I got it. But laying off eighty people the day after, like, fuck up. Especially when you see places like, uh, like grocery stores, like Shoprite, Shop and Shop, like these places are yep. actually increasing salaries. Yep. For people that have to show up to work every day, but yep. yeah. Um, so, hey, if you're uh, an ex Cardone employee and you need a new gig, hit me up. <laughs> <laughs> hit me up. Well, you know, I'm I'm always hiring. But um, yeah, I mean. I think that it's important, you know, just wrapping up on that, on that subject, it's important to stay in your lane. You know, I adopted that mentality a long time ago. Mm -hmm. Some of the best advice I ever received was just mind my own business. Yep. You no, know, because what other people do, what other people make, you know, what you do in your business, it's not going to affect me, what I do in my business. Right. So you have to remain authentic and uh, you know, just stay in your, stay in your lane, stay in your, in your, in your, in your niche. And uh, don't be stupid. Don't be stupid. Some people make their first hundred grand and go out and put a down payment on a fucking, you know, brand new Mercedes. <laughs> yep, don't, don't do that. Don't be don't stupid. Do yeah, don't be stupid. Yeah. So, um, all right. So I want to, I want to switch gears up again and okay. I want to talk about what you would say to somebody that is not gotten started in business. Okay. Uh, they're brand new, right? Okay. They're listening to the show. They don't even know what they want to do yet. What kind of advice would you offer to somebody that wants to be so, an entrepreneur? So I've been asked this question multiple times. And so at the end of the day, it's summed up in three words. I'm going to tell you a story that goes along with these three words. Okay. The three words are you're not perfect. Okay. So when I started a company in 2014, it was called AM open house. It was the second open house management platform to hit the market for real estate. Okay. And basically for lack of a better way to put it, if you've ever been to an open house, all it is, is it's a digital signing sheet, name, phone number, email address. You work with an agent, you've been pre-approved for a mortgage. Very simple, right? Click a couple buttons on your iPad or your phone, click submit, agent gets the info. Um, the person goes walk around the house, right? So when I came up with this app, I did it because I was leaving an open house in Dix Hills, this nice area on Long Island. I had 52 investors come to an open house in an hour and a half. And I was all excited. I had the windows down, driving 70 on the LIE and like, a complete act of magic, this piece of paper went flying out the fucking window. Okay. Like gone doing 70 miles an hour in the LA. So I get home, I'm all pissed. I'm like, ah, whatever, you know, like those guys will call me. It'll be fine. But I'm like, I'm like, why am I using, I'm like 24, 25 years old at the time. I'm like, why am I using a pen and paper at open house? Like, this just seems dumb. Like, well, I have an iPad. Why aren't I using the iPad? So I start looking, you know, on the iPad, I found one app that was kind of what I wanted, but it didn't integrate with anything and this and that. So I was like, you know what? I was like, I'm just going to build it. I bet you it's cheap to build. So I literally went on at the time it was called, um, it's called Upwork now, but I forgot what it was called then. It was called, oh, it was, it was called, called Elance. Uh, Elance. Elance. Okay. So I go yeah. on Elance and, uh, you know, I typed this whole thing out, right? I, I put it on paper for myself. I typed this whole thing out. 
And a guy comes back to me, he's like, yeah, I could do that for, it was like 900 bucks. Okay. All right, let's do it. 900 bucks, I'm in. So builds the thing. So we went from idea to market in 92 days. Okay. This thing was the ugliest fucking app you have ever seen in your entire life. I promise you, you've never seen an uglier app, but it functioned, right? It worked and it worked well. So over the next two years, we spent time redesigning the UI, redesigning the interfaces, redesigning the flows. So, but what we did first was get it to market, right? And now our customers were telling us, hey, I wish your app did this. Great, we built that. Hey, I wish your app looked like this. Great, we did that, right? So stop trying to be perfect before you start your business. You don't need to have every single thing perfectly done and you know exactly the time you're gonna launch and, and all these things that you think you need. You're not perfect and neither is your business. If you have an idea, rush it to market, figure out the details later. I think mm. it was, who was it that said, uh, I forget what he said. He goes, he goes, if you have, I think it was Richard Branson. He goes, if someone gives you an opportunity, say yes, even if you don't know how to do it and figure that out later. Yeah, I, dude, I couldn't agree more, man. It's like the entrepreneur jumps off a building and figures out how to right. put, a, put a fucking, <laughs> right. a fucking uh, parachute, a parachute together. together. Right. Yeah, just jump in. You know, I, dude, so, and, and this is with no tech experience, right? Like you were in, you don't come from like a coding background. You're not a programmer. Like you're not like. I have no uh, idea how to code. I mean, I can read yeah. the stuff and like, I can look at it and kind of understand it, but I can't write code. But now, but like when you had this idea, oh, yeah. you went on Upwork, you said, hey, I need to build this. You wrote it down yep. you, and you brought something to market. You made it become real. Yep. And that's what I fucking love about entrepreneurship. You know, it's creating yep. and innovating. Just make it happen. Make it happen. I did something literally six months ago. I had an idea. I'm laying down. I'm on the couch, you know, just thinking in my head and I had this idea when I'm up work literally like the later that night drew out this whole idea right. found a developer it wasn't 900 bucks wish it was well but, this, is, you know, this uh, is back 2013 2014 yeah. so it's like you know it's years ago yeah yeah yeah, um, yeah. now it would probably be a couple thousand bucks for the same thing exactly and and and, and I created this uh this platform called likewise and yep. literally took on my first client like a month after Great. And we're still in business today. So for the person out there, like listener, if you have an idea, if you think that you can do something better than it's already being done, it is a lot easier and simpler to create it, to make it happen, to make it real than you think. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, you know, a lot of people think that you need to have millions and millions of dollars and tons of VC capital to, uh, you know, to get started and so on and so forth. Like you don't like, even if it looks shit, take a look at what Google looked like when they first came out. Right. Take a look at what Facebook looked like when right. they first came out. Right. Just, well, here's just, the other part of that, right? You know, like bring it to when market. You talk about when you talk about venture capital, like I'm glad I never took investment money. Right. Because honestly I would have squandered it. I would have been like, Oh, well I should try this and I should try that. And I should try this because it's not my money. Right. Like the fact that I founded that company with, with my own money, that meant every dollar that went into marketing, every dollar that went into production, every dollar that went into development, every dollar went into engineering, whatever it was, was a dollar that I can't use for something else, right? Mm -hmm. So like I cared about every dollar that went into that business and that business ran so lean, our overhead in total was about 4% of income. It was like nothing. We, we ran like the whole business was profitable, like from literally the first month on. It was crazy. So not everybody's going to be able to do that, right? Of course. Um, so, I mean, somebody... Some people out there have to borrow, uh, of course. you know, money. So, you know, just don't let don't that. Don't borrow more than you need. Borrow exactly what you think you need and no more. Mm, you can always get more money. You can always get more money. But don't, if you have a budget, like that will force you to stay within that budget, right? If you're like, I could do this for 25 grand, borrow 25 grand. That's it. Don't borrow 50 because you're like, oh, if I make a mistake, I have a cushion. No. Use the 25. Mm. If you have to borrow, just get what exactly what you need. Boom. I like it. All right, man. So let me ask you this question. Who are some of the people in business that you look up to? So, you know, like I'm going to go with like famous people here, right? Because I think that, you know, most people are obviously going to, going to understand them. So I'm a, first of all, a huge Gary Vaynerchuk fan. That guy, that guy's hustle is one of the most amazing things I've ever seen in my life. Um, just how he's constantly putting out content. Like it's just, it's absolutely wild to me. Uh, I'm also a, a crazy big Mark Cuban fan. Um, 
Cuban to me has done something that, you know, kind of came from basically nothing, obviously owner of the Dallas Mavs right now. And he's not, he's not just one of these guys who fell into it because, you know, he, he made one good business decision, right? He's made good business decision after good business decision after good business where he just understands business better than just about anybody out there. Um, I've read, you know, a ton of his books and, and it's just, it's really amazing to me what kind of business entrepreneur he truly is. Like he's outspoken in a lot of ways and he gives, you know, Trump shit and he gave Hillary shit. And like, you know, he, he has his po- political part and I don't care about that. When I'm talking about it, strictly just his business acumen is just unbelievable. Mm. And like, you know, if, if you don't know, you know, for the listeners out there, if you guys don't know where he came from or what he did, you know, most people just know him as the guy on Shark Tank that everybody wants to partner with. If you don't know his backstory, like it's crazy. I mean, like one of the things he did when he sold his first company was he bought the American Airline Lifetime Pass, which they don't even issue anymore. It was like 150 grand. It was unlimited first class flights for life. Like, no way. Yeah, they don't even, they don't even offer it anymore, right? So like, <laughs> But like, who even has the foresight for that? Like, oh, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to buy unlimited first class flights for life because over the lifetime that I have this, I'll wind up spending millions of dollars in first class instead. Like stupid shit that he's done. You're just like, brilliant. (laughs) Wow. Yeah, Mark, uh, definitely, you know, super inspirational entrepreneur. I've read his story and, uh, you know, I I, I like his humility. Like he's very, like, he's just laid back. Yep. It's like, for the, the rich people in the world, man, they're just like very laid back. Yeah. You don't see them on Instagram, you know, showboating right. the, the Gucci and the, and the Ferragamo. And uh, it's yeah, like, I saw a picture of, uh, did you say that movie Uncut Gems? Yeah, I just saw it the other day, actually. I saw okay. it two days ago. So Adam Sandler's worth like 400 some million million. Yeah. <laughs> He's in a picture on Instagram with this cast. The guy literally looks homeless. Like, yeah, he, looks, pretty, he doesn't give a shit. He looks homeless. Have he's you a, seen that Cribs episode where, uh, <laughs> what's, what's the little guy that, uh, that he's friends with? Um, Rob Schneider? Yeah, yeah, okay? yeah. Okay, so like the Cribs episode, he literally, like, he lives in this giant house. He's like, this is the house that Sandler built. <laughs> 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 like they all, they all like know that he's the guy. And then, yeah. Like, they, and then none of them give a shit. It's like amazing. they all just hang out all back. It's amazing, man. It's amazing. So, Anthony, man, going forward, you know, it's 2020 right now. We're making this March 26, 2020. Uh, going forward, man, rest of the year, next five years, 10 years, you know. So this year's going to be an interesting year. Um, this year's going to be an interesting year. So depending on when things open up, my personal prediction is we're not, we're not out of this situation we're in until May 1st at the earliest. Uh, that's my personal thing. I Listen, I hope we are. I think the economy is, you know, obviously taking a beating right now and um, I think we, we all need to get back to work for back, lack of a better way to put it. Um, you know, one, two year plan, you know, we want to grow 20% a year at minimum. Um, five year, we hope to double agency size um, within five years. Um, and, you know, obviously the exits, the exit, right? However, that, that means, you know, whether we merge with another big company, um, someone winds up buying us out. I don't know what's going to happen, but we're, we're on trajectory for, you know, well, some big player will 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 be on someone's radar in probably the next five years, which will be good. You could maybe sell to uh, Billy Jean. Yes, yeah, but honestly, he wouldn't even be big enough. He's not big enough. I, I don't know the ad space. So. Yeah, he's not. He's, he does he does big money in, in advertising, but he doesn't have. He's not going to have the client base, the high ticket client base to support us. So you're just going all in on the ad ad uh, advertising is the game right now. It's it's crazy, and and I'm curious to see what new social comes out like TikTok just came out. You just, I don't know if you know this, but to advertise on TikTok, you have to write TikTok a $25,000 check just to get in the door. Um, it's crazy. So it's going to be interesting when more advertisements start popping up and they start opening up to the, to the little guy, so to, so to speak. Um, but I'm curious to see what the next piece of social media is. I don't know how I feel about that. Honestly. I mean, I'm sure that they, they have to, uh, like it would be silly not to because they have so many users, but the ads that you see on TikTok are entertaining. Yeah. Like sometimes I don't even think I don't even realize I'm watching an ad. Well, it has to be right. It has to fit yeah. into their. Yeah. You're just swiping are. and then you just, you're right. watching this video and then there's a call to action button. Yep. Uh, but I mean the $25,000 check, I mean, it makes sense. I mean, dude, you can literally get a million views in, in, in a, in a less than a day. Right. On TikTok, like, right. And Instagram, you can't even do that. No. Right. Not, a chance. Not, not anymore. Used to back in the day. Right. But, and Facebook, forget about it. Uh, getting attention on Facebook is like, 
pulling out your own tooth. <laughs> yeah. It's terrible. Like I, I, I'm all for advertising on Facebook, but the organic reach, like when I've, you know how many times I've literally felt like just driving to Facebook headquarters in San Fran and just being like, what the fuck are you doing with this app? Like this yeah, is, they, it was they just don't care. App. It's, it's, don't it's give all advertising. Fuck. It's they all don't like, again, care. it's inventory, right? So they don't have the inventory. So they're not going to show your space. They don't care. They don't they're, care at all. Uh, the only time Facebook, you get attention on Facebook is if you, somebody passes away and you get love or likes for that, you know, condolences, you get married, you have a baby or you right. start like some huge drama. Right. But you know, you post on there, you start a new business. You're going to hear crickets. Crickets. But if you tell them you got a new job, everybody's, uh, everybody's yeah. all for you. Yeah. It, it, it's <laughs> Facebook, Facebook, man. Unbelievable. Facebook. Unbelievable, man. All right, man. So um, I have one last question for you. Okay. Uh, but before I do and ask that question, uh, I want to allow the listeners to get in contact with you because I know okay. people are going to want to reach out about you yep. know the advertising stuff and just connect with you and whatnot. So what's the best place for them to do that? So Facebook Messenger is the best place. Um, it's forward facebook.com forward slash Anthony, A-N-T-H-O-N-Y, man, M-A-N-N, eight, five. Okay. Um, if you guys would rather email me, you're not comfortable on Facebook Messenger. You're worried I'm not going to see it. It's A is an Apple, M is in Mary at a social strategy.com. So again, A M at a social strategy.com. Boom. And we'll link that in the show notes. Perfect. So the last question, man, and uh, I ask each guest to really think about this. Take a minute. Okay. Uh, but what is the all time best advice that you've ever received in your entire life? All time best advice I've ever received in my entire life. It's a good question. It's a good question. I don't know, actually. I've received a lot of good advice. So it's to say, to pull one out as the best one. Pull one out of the hat. So, all right. So one of the, one of the best things that has basically helped me, I guess, kind of get to where I am today is to invest before I spend, okay? So, and that, that can mean anything, right? So like, obviously, you know, I'm very into real estate, but investing in anything, stocks, bonds, education, whatever it might be, right? So I've, I've a long time ago, it's probably going about 10, 11 years ago, um, someone told me to invest before I spend. And when I started doing that, it made a huge difference in the way I spent money um, because I now only spend on you know, stuff rarely, right? I pay my rent and I pay my car bills and I pay that kind of stuff, right? That's got to get paid, but I don't waste any money anymore. And so when I invest in things, that dollar is now there making me more money, whether it's a penny a year or five cents a year or a dollar a year. Um, or again, if it's education, right? It's something I'm learning, a skill that I didn't have that I'm now able to put and apply into my business or help a friend with their business because it's a skill I didn't have. So investing before I spent uh, was a very, very powerful piece of advice that I that I heard years ago. Boom. Well, there you go, folks. Anthony, it's been a pleasure to have you on the show. You too, man. A uh, lot of fun and a lot of value. Uh, for the listeners out there, thank you so much for tuning in. And uh, Anthony, I'll check you out uh, next time, man. We'll Sounds good, buddy. I'll talk to you soon. All right. Later. All right, man.